Well, good morning, church. Morning. Good to be back in the house of the Lord with you. And it's wonderful to have Mark and Becky back in our midst today. Amen. I, I don't mind being Pastor Dad. I don't mind being Brother Mark, but it's a little tough to be, be both. <laughs> so it's good to have you back. Uh, for those of you that are going to follow with me in the scripture today, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke in chapter number 19. Luke 19. And I'm going to be running all over the Bible with you today, so hopefully you've got an ink pen and a piece of paper where you can jot down some scriptures. I believe the Lord, and I've already said this before a couple of times maybe, I don't know, but I believe the Lord is doing a new work in me, and I'm thankful for that. He's getting me excited about, you know, I love to preach, and I get excited every time I get a chance to preach. I just want to lay down God for Jesus Christ and the very word. And I, I hope to be doing that until I'm a, well, I'm already a very old man, but I hope to be doing it until I'm a really, really, really very old man. And the Lord calls me home. I hope to be still preaching and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm getting very excited because he's been moving on my heart here lately to be more of a teacher, preacher, and I love that. Uh, I love just sitting around the house and studying the scripture and listening to the Holy Spirit as he gives me thoughts and intents of his heart and his mind. It's just a wonderful thing. He's also been showing me some prophetic things, which is a brand new thing for me. I need your prayers on that, because to be honest with you, that's making me just a little bit on the nervous side. I've never been one of the prophetic type of a guy, but the Lord has been showing me some some things in that area too. So I stand in need of your prayers. And I stand in need of your prayers this morning as once again I open up his word. And uh, I told you Luke chapter 19 and here I am in John chapter 11. I need to go to Luke chapter 19. Laura brings up a wonderful prayer request this morning. How many times in our lives are we attempting to do something, or would like to do something, or have been praying about doing something, but we just can't see the Lord's hand. Have you ever been there? Or maybe you're noticing something in our world, in our society, in your neighbor's house right down the street, when there's an injustice. Something that's going on, and it's, it's just sad. You see it family that's dealing with something, your heart goes out to them, and you're, you're trying hard to see Jesus' face in a certain circumstance or a situation, although you know it's there. I mean, you trust Him, you believe, you know that He's real, and you know that the Scripture teaches you that He, he promises never, ever to leave us or to forsake us. But here you are, right in the middle of and you're looking for Jesus' face. And you're having trouble seeing him. Have you ever been this? Can anybody identify with that? I can certainly identify with that. I can certainly identify with that. And I think that there's a lot of people in our world that can absolutely identify with that. And so today, I want to read to you some, once again, some very familiar scriptures that every one of you in here is familiar with the story of Zacchaeus, I'm sure. And I think it probably wasn't but a month ago that I preached a message on, the, on Zacchaeus and, and climbing up in the sycamore tree and Jesus shouting out to him and telling him to come down. And you know, every time that we preach that, we wind up preaching pretty much the same message. And it's a good message. But this week as I was actually floating through the internet, and for whatever reason, I was looking at different types of trees and things of that nature, I came across what the Bible, what the, what the internet was calling a sycamine tree. And that caught my attention because I know that I've read about the sycamine tree in the scripture. And so I went to the scripture, and the scripture concerning the, concerning the sycamine tree was tied in with the scripture concerning the, concerning the sycamore tree, and that turns out to be the same tree. Just one guy's pronunciation of it was a little bit different. I gave everybody a handout today. It's got a picture of this 
closer you can love a racing than is a tree. Do you see that? This is the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus would have climbed up in. Now see, we here in Indiana, we, we've got sycamore trees, and our sycamore trees look absolutely nothing like this. So when I got to looking at that sycamore tree, this Middle Eastern sycamore, actually a sycamore fig tree, when I got looking at this, and I thought to myself, Zacchaeus climbed up in that thing? How in the world did he ever see Jesus? How in the world did Jesus ever see him? Mm -hmm. You know, we get it in our minds about these sycamore trees that kind of got like a white bark on them and they're tall and the limbs are high, but they're kind of sparse. And so if you do happen to make it up the trunk of that tree and stand out on one of them limbs, you're going to be high out in the air and you're going to be able to see everything and everybody's going to be able to see you, but that's certainly not the... And certainly not the picture that we get if we take a look at this sycamore tree. And that sparked a Bible study in my heart and in my mind. And it's that study that I want to share with you today. Read with me, if you will, the book of Luke, chapter 19. And say amen if you're there. Amen. Luke, chapter 19. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little stature, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste, and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that, he was going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Very familiar reading of the scripture today. And it happens to be one of my favorite stories in all of the scripture. As a matter of fact, the older that I get, and I try very hard to remember back to the days when I was younger, this is one of the verses of scripture that stands out to my mind that I know I was taught over and over and over again when I was a little kid. How many of us remember that song about Zacchaeus being a little man and climbed up in the tree and Jesus came down and told him to come down out of the tree. I remember the song. I remember the teaching. And it seems like every time that we, that we visit this verse of scripture concerning Zacchaeus, we hear the same message over and over and over again. But I want to tell you something. After looking at what this tree looks like, I believe that Zacchaeus climbed up in this sycamore tree for other reasons than what we normally preach and what we normally teach. Now I can preach to you this morning the message that this sycamore tree in Jericho is nothing like the sycamores of Indiana. We've already talked about that. You can look at the picture and you can see that they're extremely bushy and that they're easy to hide in. Folks, Zacchaeus did not want the people to see him in that crowd. He was a dishonest man. He was a crooked man. He was a lion man. He was a cheat. He was a thief. Back in biblical days, one of the lowest of the lowest jobs that you could ever have would have been a shepherd. And one step above the shepherd would have been to have been a publican or a tax collector. For a couple of different reasons. If you were a tax collector, then you were employed by Rome. And Rome was the mortal enemy of Israel. And so, here's Zacchaeus rubbing elbows and rubbing shoulders with the Romans being paid to come and take the Israelites' money or lay claim to the Israelites' property. <coughs> and Zacchaeus, as most publicans were, when he came to your house to collect your 
taxes, he added a little bit more. And he would take from you what you owed to Rome. He would give Rome your money, but he would keep that portion that he kept for himself and put it in his pocket. He was a dishonest man. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a scoundrel. And the Bible says that he was the chief of all the publicans, which tells me he had to have been the worst of the worst, or they never would have promoted him to have been the chief over all of the publicans. Hmm. So here comes Jesus. And Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus. And Zacchaeus was intrigued about Jesus. And he wanted to see him. And he wanted to know him, who he was. So far, I'm not preaching anything that you've never heard me preach before, am I? See, I'm leading up to something. But something else that entered into my mind this week when I started studying about this bushy tree that is known as a sycamore fig tree. When Zacchaeus, if Zacchaeus were to climb up in one of our Indiana sycamore trees, the whole world would have saw him. But Zacchaeus, knowing that he had cheated you, and he had cheated you, and he had cheated you, he didn't want you, and you, and you to see him. But yet he wanted to see Jesus. So he had a dilemma. And then it popped into Zacchaeus' mind. I'm a little bitty guy, and if I can get up into that bushy sycamore tree, I'll be able to see Jesus when he passes by, and all of these people are not going to even notice that I'm here. So Zacchaeus, one, because he was a little man, couldn't see over the top of their heads, he decided, I'm going to climb up in this sycamore tree. He was sneaking around, he was hiding around, getting up in this sycamore tree, because he didn't want to be seen by the people, and I believe that he didn't want to see, be seen by the Lord. Because when we come face to face with Jesus Christ, our sin comes face to face with us. You cannot stand in a sinful condition and look Jesus Christ in the face and remain the same. You will forevermore be changed when you are confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Zacchaeus, knowing his lifestyle, and Zacchaeus, knowing his sinful past, he wanted to see Jesus, but he didn't want any of you to see him seeing him, and he certainly didn't want the Holy One of Israel to look upon his face. So he said, I'll climb up in this sycamore tree. Then we know how the scripture goes. Jesus came walking by. And he stopped. And he looked up in that sycamore tree. And he called Zacchaeus out by name. And he said, come down out of that tree. For today I must abide at thy house. And today you need to know that Jesus Christ knows your name. And the message that we always preach, and I intend on preaching it until God calls me home, is that you can hide whatever you want to hide in whatever sycamore you want to hide it in. But you're not hiding nothing from the all-seeing, all-knowing eye of Jesus Christ. He's able to pierce through the thickness of the fig leaves that Adam and Eve was wrapped up in. was hid in. And today we can try to hide ourselves. Today we can try to sneak ourselves. Today we can try to get by by hiding our sin. But hear me today, you will never hide your sin from the face of Jesus Christ. I had one preacher tell me this week, why are you always crying out against sin? God called you out from being
the church. Something else for the church is looking at this not through the eyes of Jesus, but I want you to be Zacchaeus. Verse, you ladies can be Zacchaeus. I want you to take a look. I want you to stop and put yourself there. And I want you to be him. And I want you to I want you to get that feeling inside your heart, inside your mind that was inside it. This is the man that I've heard about who is able to change people's lives. And I don't like being a cheat. And I don't like being a scandal. And I really don't like all these people not liking me. I'm going to have to sneak around them, but i got to see this guy. I'm going to have to climb up in that tree where I can be hid from them. Oh, man, he's holy. He can't look upon me. And I'm going to look upon him. I'm, I'm getting up in that sycamore tree. And he'll never see me. I want you to be that guy because, because if you are that guy today, here in just a moment, I'm going to open up this altar and I'm going to ask you to receive Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But there's another Zacchaeus that has climbed up in this tree. And I think there's a lot of the, these Zacchaeuses that are here with us today. Preacher, I don't know what's going on. I was a good mom. I was a good dad. I worked so hard to cook breakfast and pack sack lunches and send my kids out. I went to their, I went to their school programs. I dropped them off at their ball games. I protected them from things that I was afraid was going to bring hurt or harm to them. I, I was a good mom. I, I, I washed their clothes. I folded them. I put them
need wisdom, and right now I don't know what to do. She's in a sycamore tree. That to make her grab. She's in a sycamore tree. You don't know how many times I've been in a sycamore tree trying to hold down a job, trying to take care of a home, trying to pastor two churches. I got one congregation that wants it one way, another congregation that wants it another way. I'm getting pulled this way. I'm getting pulled this way. And sometimes I'm just saying, Lord, where's your face? I need to see you. And then all of a sudden, the Lord says, you can't see me. But you're right there on that land, right in the middle of the tree. Zacchaeus, come on now. Pastor, my job's failing. I'm in a sycamore. Pastor, my farm's failing. I'm in a sycamore. Pastor, whatever your sycamore might be, you get blinded by it. My heart's going out to my friend because she's sick. You're in a sycamore. Your friend is in a sycamore. Every one of us, if you're not in a sycamore right now, you've been in a sycamore. And if you've never been in a sycamore and you're not in one right now, you better pay attention because there's a sycamore out here. <laughs> this message that we always preach, it's a good one. But there's absolutely another one that's less preached and less heard. Sometimes it's hard to see Jesus through all the leaves, isn't it? Sometimes it's really hard to see Jesus through all the leaves. Question. Look at this tree. How in the world did Zacchaeus see through all that thick, bushy tree? And here's the answer. We don't know that he did it. I read the scripture to you. I took you all the way through those verses concerning Zacchaeus in this sycamore tree and his conversation with Jesus. And in the scripture, we saw that Jesus saw Zacchaeus. But nowhere in the scripture did we see that Zacchaeus saw Jesus. Did you see it in there? Because if you saw it in there, please teach me. I want to know. But I don't believe I've seen anywhere in the reading of the scripture today where Zacchaeus said, Oh, there he is, there he is, there's Jesus! And then Jesus, catch Jesus' attention, and Jesus looked up and said, All right, Zacchaeus, calm down. We didn't read it that way. And the reason we didn't read it that way is because it's not written that way. So I can't look at you in the face with a clear conscience and tell you that Zacchaeus was able to see Jesus. I can look at you and tell you that Jesus was able to see Zacchaeus. And that's encouraging. And that's something for the church. The answer to that question is we don't know that he did. The scripture doesn't say that, but it does say that Jesus saw him and that he called him out. Now that's a message that's worth preaching. So today I want to ask you some questions. Three questions. What do you do when you can't see the Lord through your sycamore? That's the one question I want to ask. I'm going to give you three answers. The one question we're going to ask you today is what do you do when you can't see Jesus through life? What do you do when you can't see Jesus for the hospital rooms? What do you do when you can't see Jesus for the tombstones. What do you do when you can't see Jesus because we've got a whacked out government that wants to change everything that the United States of America has ever been? What do you do when you can't see Jesus through bankruptcy? What do you do when you can't see Jesus through sickness? What do you do when you can't see Jesus through your bushy sycamore? The first thing I want to share with you is don't ever give up. If you're taking notes, the first thing that you want to do when you can't see Jesus is to keep on going. Don't ever give up. Get determined to follow Jesus. You say, but I can't see. How can I follow if I can't see? You do that by faith. The scripture says that we don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. Sometimes you're not always going to see him. Sometimes you're not always going to hear him. But those are the times when you need to be determined to follow Him closer than you've ever followed Him before. Never give up. Be determined. Galatians 6, 9 says, And not be weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if you faint not. There is a reaping that is going to come one day. Be steadfast, unmovable, 
in the Lord. Don't ever give up. But preacher, I can't see. It's all right. Close your eyes. Reach out your hand. Let Jesus lead you. Let Jesus guide you. Walk by faith and not by sight. Maybe you're learning a lesson that you need to learn. Maybe Jesus is there allowing you to be in a sycamore so that for the first time in your life you'll quit trusting in your own ability and reach out a blinded hand and say, I can't see. I know there's stumbling blocks. I know there's pitfalls. I know there's valleys and gulches. Lord, take me by the hand and lead me through this valley of the shadow of death because I can't see. But I don't need to see because I've got your hand. Friend, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. It would be easy. It would be easy for you to give up. Yeah. That's the easy thing to do. I'm trying to tell you something else. God never called me to make it easy for you. Preacher, you preach some hard things sometimes. Amen. I'm glad I lay out some hard things. Because there's way too many easyisms that's getting preached in our world today and coming from our pulpits. There wasn't nothing easy about Jesus Christ bleeding and dying on an old rugged cross. Amen. Nothing was easy about that. As a matter of fact, the night before he hung on the cross, he spent some time in the garden crying out to his father, Father, if there's any other way, yeah. let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was nothing easy about the old rugged cross. And to be honest with you, when I hear these preachers get in their pulpits preaching all these easy isms, it just makes the Holy Ghost tear on the back of my head stand. It's not always easy. And God didn't call me to show you an easy way. God called me to tell you there's two paths. One of them's broad, one of them's wide, and the whole world's going down that one. One of them's narrow. One of them's straight. There's no room for error. And it leads you right to the path of righteousness, and few there be that find it. And I don't want to spend my whole life long preaching to a group of people that wind up on a broad path. Hear me today. If you think about our world population, how much is a few of our world? That could be millions. Preacher. Woo! Millions as old as straight and narrow. All right. What's the population of our nation as a whole? Well, you know, I guess a few of that's going to be several hundred thousand. Praise God, there's several hundred thousand going to be making it down the straight and narrow path. Okay. What's the population of the state of Indiana? Well, now you're choking it down a little bit. Maybe there's a few thousand that's going to make it down the straight and narrow. What's the population of Rochester or Akron or Macy? Well, now you're only talking about a few hundred. What's the population of the people sitting in the pews at Omega Church? Look around. Look around. Are you one of the few? You see, I don't want to preach easyism. I want to preach the truth. I'm going to tell you there's no way to make it to heaven outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. Religion doesn't want me to do that. God called me to do that. I'm going to tell you that Jesus said, if you die in your sin, where I am, there you cannot come. I want you to say, preacher, that's hard because i got sin in my life. And then I want to look you in the eye and tell you, I love you enough to tell you the truth. It is hard, but it's easy. Because Jesus shed his life's blood that you might be delivered from the power of that sin. Put it under the blood and get over it. And go on and give honor and glory to the life of Jesus Christ. There's nothing easy about it. And the easy thing for you to do, for those of you right now that are in a sycamore tree and you can't see to help your children, you can't see to help your marriage, you can't see to help your job, you can't see to help your friend, you can't see to make the decision about the job, whatever your sycamore might be, for those of you that are in the sycamore, I want to tell you to buck up. I want to tell you to walk in faith. I want to tell you to don't be discouraged. I want to tell you to get determined. I want to tell you that they Throw up your hands, wave the white flag.
bag and go home. And so many people do that. Oh, it must not have been the, must not have been the will of the Lord because it was hard. I'm going to tell you a little insight. If it's really easy for you, either the Lord has paved a golden path or you're on the wrong trail. And you need to, you need to do some serious soul searching and ask the Lord, am I on the right path or not? I've found it in my life the hardest battles and the harder the valley, I found out that those were the times when the Lord was working something in my life. It would be easy for you to give up. It's harder to hold on and keep believing. But friend, that's where the reward is. Amen? Galatians tells us that if we don't grow weary and well-doing, we will reap in due season if we faint not. That means if we don't give up, if we don't give in, if we don't throw in the towel, if we keep on believing, if we keep on moving forward, even if you move two steps, you move, you moved. If you don't give up and you don't get in, give in, it might be hard, but there's a reaping coming. Amen. And there's a reward coming. Oh, praise His holy name this morning. Just don't ever give up. The second thing I want to point out to you that we see in this story of Zacchaeus climbing up in the sycamore tree is that I want you to never stop looking for the Lord in your life. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. I've lost my husband. Don't ever stop looking for the Lord in your life. Amen? Amen. I've lost my life. Don't ever stop looking for the Lord in your life. Because I want to tell you why. The Lord has got something else for you. And I want to tell you, it's going to be better than what you had, but I want to tell you, it's going to be at least equally as good. God's got things for you in your life. Never stop looking for the Lord because just because you don't see Him doesn't mean He isn't there. Look for the good in everything, church, because that's where God is. Zacchaeus' heart's desire was to see Jesus Christ and to know who he was. He sought Jesus out. I want to I read this to you. This is, this is Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. But preacher, I don't see him so I don't know if he's near. Stand in faith on the promise found written in the word of God when Jesus Christ said,
So you can always seek the Lord because the Lord's always with you. You can always cry out to the Lord because the Lord is always near. And if it's your heart's desire to see the Lord's face in your circumstance or in your situation, I just showed you biblical promises. That if you trust in Him and you delight yourself in Him, He will give you the desires of your heart. Well, preacher, how come I'm in this sick morning? How come, Pastor Dad, when you were going through all these little bullet points trying to make this message fit, you were talking about being a good mom, you are talking about being a good dad, you are talking about having a sick friend, you are talking about all this stuff. And you just, ooh, put that arrow right where it needed to be. I'm not telling you you're not trusting in the Lord. I'm not telling you maybe you're not even seeking His face. I'm not saying that you're probably not calling on I'm saying what you need to do is accumulate all those things together and put your trust in it. I'm telling you that you need to trust in it. I'm telling you, you need to delight yourself in Him. He is the source. He is the source of your joy. He is the source of your peace. He is the source of your fellowship. He is the source of your faith. He's the source of life. Everything that is good and perfect for your life, He is the source of it. And I had to learn a tough lesson. I believed that He was the source of it. But I also believed He needed to use me to make it happen. And I fought, 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 and I fought. And I was always in the same old sycamore. I couldn't see. But when I decided to get myself out of the way and let Him be God in my life, that's when He stood outside my sycamore tree and said, Hey, Dad, come down out of that tree. Today I'm going to go home with you. That was the day that I was able to see my prayers get answered. That was the day I was able to hear the voice of the Lord in my life, which brings me to my last point. We're going to close with this. So we're never going to give up. Say it with me. I'm never going to give up. Amen. Say it with me. I'm going to be determined. <laughs> Say this with me. I'm never going to stop looking for the Lord in life. <laughs> well, you got that close. That was a lot of words to say. Now I want you to say this one. I'm going to listen for His voice. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just be like, like Abraham?
There's several ways to hear the Lord. One quick and easy way to hear the Lord is to pick this burger up right Amen. here. Amen. I should have called it a burger out of this book. Pick this book up and read it. Get familiar with it. If you never read it clear through, you need to read it clear through. Because you're going to find out. See, there was a time when I just kind of bounced around the Bible a little bit. I'd read 1st, 2nd Kings, and I'd come over and I'd read out of the Romans, and then I'd go back and I'd take a look at Esther, and then I'd, I'd read the epistles that Paul wrote, and then I'd go back into Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and I'd be like, so then <laughs> I'd read the Gospels. And, uh, and I wasn't, I was getting stuff, but man, when I, I remember when I said, Lord, I'm going to be determined. I'm going to read your word from cover to cover. You want to know what I found out? Even Leviticus and Deuteronomy wasn't. It's exciting. Mm. And you learn things. Yeah. And you understand more about the character of God when you read the whole book. And you, yeah, that's another thing. The chronological order. One of you, I think, I think it was George and Carol several years ago, they bought me a chronological Bible. And when I sat down to read it, it was totally different from anything I was used to. And I thought, oh, man, this is kind of confusing. But once I got into reading that Bible, there was all kinds of things that happened to me over my life. And it's that revelation that comes to your heart. That's God speaking to your spirit. Showing you attributes. One after another, after another, after another. That's God speaking to your heart. Do I marry this guy? Do I marry that girl? That's God speaking to your heart. Do I keep on trusting on behalf of my children? And the answer to that question you keep receiving is yes. And you keep thinking, yeah, but it's so hard. You're having a conversation with God. What about my friend? You're, you're listening to God. The devil is not going to want you to be concerned about your friend. The devil's not going to want you to be concerned about your children. The devil's not going to want you to be concerned about anything. So when you feel that holy tug on your heart, folks, that's God talking to you. <laughs> and you need to listen to that. And when something happens in your life that is so totally unexpected and is so totally just out there and boom, it's an it's a open door of opportunity and you stop and you look at it and you think to yourself, is there any potential harm in this? Is there any potential sin in this? Is it going to take me away from this? Is it going to take me away from that? What's it going to do to my testimony? And if all those things come out crystal clear, God's talking to you about something. And we need to learn to listen to his voice because I want to tell you something. There's a voice of a stranger that is no longer a stranger's voice. Amen. And he's talking to everybody. And he's attacking your faith. And he's causing you to mistrust, to distrust the Word of God. He's causing you to doubt. Is this really what God said? Isn't that what he did to Eve in the garden? Yeah. Did God really say that? Mm -hmm. Wow, I wish each pastor would have stood up and said, hey, get focused on Jesus Christ and don't listen to that. <laughs> because the voice of the stranger will become familiar the longer you listen to it. And if you listen to that voice long enough, it's going to lead you astray. Learn how to listen. Learn how to listen. I'm going to leave you with this. This is in the book of John. And it's chapter number 10. And it says, this is Jesus, my sheep, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. <coughs> Jesus knows you, you know him, and you follow him. I never knew this to be, I, I've always heard it, but I never really knew it was the truth until recently. I was on a job site, and these people, these people were building goat sheds. But they didn't have goats. They had sheep. And so they were building goat sheds for their sheep to get in. And they had all kinds of sheep out there. 
And I started sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with this guy. And I told him that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. He said, that's the truth. Go out there and try to get them sheep to follow you. And I thought for a minute, what if these sheep follow me? <laughs> I just stood on I went out there and the sheep ran from me. But when I got out of the pen and he got in the pen, here they come. He didn't even say a word. He's the guy that feeds them. He's the guy that waters them. He's the guy that changes their straw. He's, he's the guy that takes care of them. So when they saw me, they thought, oh, this guy wants land chops. <laughs> when they saw him, they said, yes, this is the guy that loves me. Folks, Jesus is your sheep. You are his sheep. And he knows you. And you hear him. So you need to tune your ear to listen to that voice. Because you can't hear it. So, I think that there's an old fashioned message about Zacchaeus. Hiding out in the life of sin. Being able to conceal himself from people in the whole world. And never being able to hide from the all, all seeing eye of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to preach that message again. And maybe that Zacchaeus is in our midst today. Maybe you've been up in that sick and hot tree for so long and you think you've got him snuggered. Let me tell you something. He sees you sick. He knows where you're at. And he's calling to you today to come down out of your tree. Because salvation has come to your house. If that's you, here in just a moment, I want us to rise to our feet. Go ahead, rise to our feet. If that's you, as we get a song going. No one's going to think anything less of you. If they do, they need to kneel down beside you. Or maybe you're that Zacchaeus. And your eyes are blinded by all oh, in front of you. You're sick of our tree is a hard circumstance and you're trying so hard to see Jesus Christ. You know he's there but you can't see. Would you come to an altar? Would you cry out? Would you allow Jesus to say, hey child, come down out of that tree I got you. Oh my word. That's a word for someone today. Jesus has you. He's got you. Would you come? Would you come? Would you come on behalf of your children? Would you come on behalf of your home, your country, your community, whatever, whatever your sycamore tree might be, would you come on behalf of that sycamore tree? Seek the face of Jesus. Listen for his voice. Be drawn by that spirit. Would you come? Would you come? I preached last Sunday evening in Gilead about a great gulf that stands between the pulpit and the pew. And that gulf is the altar of God that used to be used so often. And now, little by little, it's disregarded. But there's still power here in the altar of God. Would you come? Bless your heart, brother. Is there another that <coughs> You say, preacher, why are you always standing up there asking us to come? Because that's what God's called me to do. I'm, I'm done trying to please to make people comfortable. I know you're roasting carrots here in a crock pot, but it's going to switch over warm and it's going to be okay. Would you come and kneel down at this altar and forget about your stomach and cry out to Jesus Christ? I'm not going to tell you this much longer. But I want you to know that the opportunity is there. Our God and our Father, as I lay my hands upon this dear brother, I thank you, Lord, for his faith. I thank you, Lord, for his faithfulness. His family is growing. His grandchildren are coming. I believe, Lord, that you're going to use him in new and exciting ways in ministry. And maybe, Lord, there's a single tree that is standing here that can't see things. I pray to God, just like Elijah prayed for his servant, that you would open up his eyes. And allow him to see the great army of God in Sardis. Give him wisdom. Give him guidance. Bless him with direction. Help him walk his way. Grow his heart to righteousness. Lord, we give you the grace. This is in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God and our Father, Lord, as I bow my head here in the pulpit, 
certainly not for the last time today, but for the last time in the midst of the Omega Church. I want to thank you, Lord, for your word and for the truth that's found written in it. I want to thank you, Lord, for breaking some chains that are in my life. This feeling that I had that I needed to just be the same as all of the preaching brethren. The way that they do it is the way that I need to do it. And the way they speak it is the way that I need to speak it. And if I don't do that, Lord, I was in such condemnation. Thank you, Lord, for breaking me free from that. Showing me new ways and using me in different avenues. And it's in that avenue and in that way, Lord, that we come to this pulpit today and deliver this message about Zacchaeus. I praise you, Lord, for the old-fashioned message that I've preached for many years alongside of many good preaching brethren. And Lord, I pray that you'll always allow me to preach that message. But I thank you for giving me my own set of glasses to search and to seek other messages found written in the same verses of Scripture. And I pray thee, Lord, that I've been able to feed these sheep. They're not mine, they're yours. I don't want them to ever run in fear. Lord, I want them to draw closer in faith as you use me to feed them. Father, I love these people, each and every one. I know that you do too, so I'm going to ask you once again, Lord, to please keep them all safe from harm's way. And bring us back at our next appointed time, and once again we can worship you. In spirit and in truth, all honor, and glory, worship, and praise I give unto thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.